It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Joining me is Marcy Shimoff, who is here to explain how we can experience happiness from the inside out, no matter what we are going through at the time. Marcy's approach to being happy doesn't depend on achievements, goals, money, relationships, or anything else external. Marcy is a number one New York Times bestselling author of Love for No Reason and Happy for No Reason. She's a woman's face of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, and she's a featured teacher in The Secret. Welcome, Marcy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Joan. I'm happy for a great reason to get to be here with you today. <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. And you know, Marcy, so many people are setting intentions and they're making resolutions. What do you think about the resolutions we make when we're trying to change everything in search of happiness? Is this the yeah. way to go about it? Well, first of all, I applaud everyone for making uh, resolutions and intentions because everything that we want to create does start with intentions. And part of the problem is that we are not creating intentions from the inside out. We aren't following our passions. I really believe that we each have given a, a, some kind of marching orders here in this life and that if you check in with your heart, you'll know what it is you're here to do. And I know this sounds really airy-fairy, but I promise that we're going to get really practical in our time here together today. So I'm going to give you some practical tools to do that. Marcy, why do you think that everyone is looking for a quick fix for happiness? Why do you think that we're all searching for this? Why is it eluding us? Well, first of all, happiness is the one thing that people have wanted since time immemorial. Uh, it's Aristotle said happiness is the goal of all goals. It's the be-all and end-all of life. It's, it's why we want anything is we think it'll make us happy. The problem is that we're going about it the wrong way. And in fact, we actually have an epidemic of unhappiness in our culture. One out of four women in North America is on antidepressants. But there's good news. And the good news is that science has cracked the happiness code. We actually know what it takes for people to be happy. As far as I'm concerned, this should be headline news. <laughs> you know, it's not really that hard, and it's so important. You ask, why are we... Why are we going about it the wrong way? We have a myth in our culture that is all pervasive. And that myth is, I'll be happier when. Mm. I'll be happier when I have a better job. I'll be happier when I make more money. I'll be happier when I lose 20 pounds. I'll be happier when I'm with the perfect person, married to the perfect person. Actually, science has shown that none of those things will make you happier. We all have something called a happiness set point. And no matter what happens to us, whether good or bad, we will tend to hover around our happiness set point. So you get what you think you wanted, and you're happier for a little while, maybe a couple months. But within a year, you've returned to your original happiness set point. So we have this myth that is leading us down the wrong alley. Success doesn't bring us happiness, but happiness will bring us success. Marcy, when I interviewed Gay Hendricks, who wrote a book called The Big Leap, he talked about a threshold for happiness. And when we go beyond that, we actually self-sabotage. And it was interesting because that was a real aha moment for me because I realized I do that. When I get too happy, I remind myself of something to bring myself down. Is that the set point that you're talking about? It is. Um, and I love Gay Hendricks and his work. And he calls it the upper limit. You get to your upper limits and you can't go anymore, getting any further because you're not used to things being better and so you self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very common. So what we need to do is actually raise our happiness set point. It's like a thermostat setting that you can raise or you can actually lower consciously. And let me just share with you a, a little tiny bit of research because to me this kind of explained everything. It's, it's about this happiness set point. It's 50% genetic. You're born with it. It's your DNA. It's only 10% your circumstances. Such a small piece of the pie, yet that's what everybody's running around trying to make better. The other 40% is your habits of thoughts and behavior. And that's the piece that you can do the most about to raise your happiness set point. Now, I'm going to take this a step further and say that there are 
scientists, progressive scientists in a field of epigenetics, amongst them is Bruce Lipton, who wrote mm-hmm. the Biology of Belief. And they say that that DNA piece, that 50% that's your, your, gen, your genes, your DNA, that can be influenced or changed by changing your habits. So that says that up to 90% of our happiness set point can be influenced by changing these habits. I call them happiness habits. And there are some specific happiness habits that you can change right away to raise your happiness set point. Number one is to move from what science calls the stress response into what's called the love response. These are physiological states that have different brain activity, different heart rhythms, and different biochemistry. And according to a group called the Institute of Heart Math, you can do some simple practices to move you into the love response. They say that five minutes in the stress response can suppress your immune system for up to six hours, Mm. whereas five minutes in the love response can strengthen your immune system for up to six hours. So I want to do a little experiment with everybody. It's it's only going to take us about a minute or a minute and a half. And, uh, And I want you to see if you feel any different. Is that all right, Joan? Okay. Okay, Joan, I'm going to ask you to be my guinea pig on this. (laughs) Okay. So that means in a minute and a half, I'm going to ask you how you feel any different. Okay. So in this process, and I want everybody to do this along with us because it's no fun to do this, to just listen. So I'd like you to, if you can, close your eyes. And if you can't close your eyes, it's fine, no problem. But if you're able to right now, if you'd close your eyes. And this is three steps. The first step is to simply place the palm of your hand on your heart. Now that simple act of putting your hand on your heart starts the flow of a chemical called oxytocin. And oxytocin is dubbed the love hormone because it's what we have more of when we are feeling love. But just putting your hand on your heart right now is starting the flow of oxytocin in your body. Now, the second step is to imagine that you're breathing in and out through the center of your heart. So just picture or feel that your breathing is coming into your heart and going out of your heart. At your own pace, you're breathing into your heart and out of your heart. And now finally, the third step is on each in-breath, Imagine that you're breathing in love, ease, and compassion. On your exhales, you can just exhale normally, but each time you take in a breath into your heart, breathe in love, breathe in ease, and breathe in compassion. And just exhale normally. And you can either say the words in silently to yourself, love, ease, and compassion, breathing them into your heart, or you can remember a time when you felt those. So one last time, breathing into your heart, love, ease, and compassion. And on your next exhale, you can slowly open your eyes if they were closed, and you can take your hand away. And I want you just to notice, how do you feel different now than you did a minute and a half ago? And Joan, you're my guinea pig, so tell Mm -hmm. me, how do you feel any different? I feel much calmer. I feel more centered. I I really do feel more relaxed. And now I have to do this interview with you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, here's the thing that I want to point out. That's great. All of those are symptoms that you've moved into the love response. And that doing this one time is not going to change anybody's life. It's just a nice experience. But here's what can change your life. If you do this two or three times a day for the next few weeks, you start to make a habit of being in the love response. Your body starts to remember it. So it becomes more and more your default state. So what I recommend is every day, sometime in the morning, sometime in the afternoon, sometime in the evening, just take a minute, do this little simple inner ease technique, it's called. And I do it while I'm standing in line at the grocery store or while I'm sitting on the phone with somebody. Nobody even has to know that you're doing it. Marcy, the people who are truly happy, what do you think they know that we don't? Mm. The only difference, and I've interviewed thousands of people who are what I call happy for no reason, meaning they have an inner state of peace and well-being that doesn't depend on their circumstances. And the one thing I've discovered that's different about them than about everybody else are these habits. They have different habits than we do. So one of them is they've learned ways to physiologically put themselves in that love response. And we, we just did that. That's one thing. Number two, gratitude. Mm -hmm. they spend much of their time in a state of gratitude. There's a saying, what we put our attention on grows stronger in our lives. And when you're focusing on what is working, you get more of that. When you're focusing on what isn't working, you get more of that. So it's not that happy people don't have problems. They do. It's that they're really grateful for whatever is working for them. So there's research that's been done that's shown that just writing down five things you're grateful for every day at the end of at the end of the day within a month that will raise your happiness set point simple simple practice marcy you were a teacher in the secret 
And that was about the law of attraction. Just if you could give a, a brief 101 on the law of attraction, and how does that relate to happiness? Great, great question. Thank you for that, Joan. So The, the Secret, um, which was a movie and a book all about the law of attraction, it swept the world. I think a billion people have either seen or read it, a billion. Um, it's about the law of attraction is based on the idea that everything in the universe is made up of energy and that we draw to us or attract to us based on our energetic vibration, the energy of our thoughts, our words, our feelings, and our actions. And so what we find is that when people are happier, and this is how happiness relates to this, happiness is a high energetic vibration. When you are actually living in this greater state of happiness, and I'm not talking about some Pollyanna state of like la-la land. That is mm -hmm. not what I mean. I mean about habituating a, a higher state of happiness through these simple practices. When you are living from that state, you are vibrating at a higher energetic level and you're able better to attract or manifest what it is you want more of in your life. One of the things I read that you tell people is don't believe everything you think. And I love that statement. What do you mean when you say don't believe everything you think? Well, just because we have a thought doesn't mean that it's true. Mm. We've tended to think, you know, our thoughts are, are gospel. They're not. Our thoughts are just, they're patterns. They're neural pathways that were developed in our brain at a very young age. And the average person has 60,000 thoughts a day. And for the average person, 80% of those are negative. We inherited this. Psychologists call this the negativity bias. We inherited it from our cavemen ancestors who had to remember the negatives or they would die. We no longer live in that kind of a, a condition where we've got to like remember about the tigers that are out there. And yet we still live in this state of negativity bias. One of my colleagues, Rick Hansen, uh, calls it the Velcro Teflon syndrome, where he says that our minds are like Velcro for the negative. They just stick to us, but they're like Teflon for the positive. The positives just slide off of us. What we want to do is reverse that tendency. We want to have the positive stick. And according to the scientists, they say it takes 20 seconds for a positive to stick long enough to create a new neural pathway in the brain, much longer than it takes for a negative take hold. The negative just very quickly takes hold and, and stimulates the neural pathways of negativity. But a positive we have to really ingrain. And that's why this concept of gratitude is very, very helpful to, um, to create new neural pathways in the brain. One of the people that I interviewed for Happy for No Reason, she actually uh, has a little practice that she calls the, Acad the Daily Academy Awards. You have to be on the lookout for what to appreciate. And so she pretends that every day she's going to give out five Academy Awards. She's going to be on the lookout for what to, what to appreciate. And it, it's just a, a simple game she plays, but it's to, to really ingrain these positive habits. And, and Joan, there's one I, I have to make sure that we get in because people always want to know what's the fast track to greater happiness. And I have to say that if there was one answer to that, I would say it's this one word, forgiveness. We cannot have greater happiness in our life when we were holding on to old anger and resentment. And forgiveness doesn't mean that you need to let another person back in your life who harmed you. Not at all. Forgiveness means you still have boundaries, but it means that you have learned to let go of any kind of resentment that you have for your own sake, not for the other person's sake. If you would like to get more information about what Marcy's been discussing, you can visit her website, happyfornoreason.com. And as always, you can visit our website, CYACYL.com, which stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. So, Marcy, give us a final thought. What's the takeaway? What do you want to leave our listeners with? I would love to, to end with this final thought. People always ask me, isn't this selfish to want to be happier? What about the world? Don't we have to save the world? And my answer is that the most important thing you can possibly do to help the world is to focus on your own happiness first. Because when you're happier, you influence all the people around you, your family, your friends, and ultimately you have an impact on the world. And so I'd like to leave you with this Chinese proverb that sums that up, and it goes like this. It says, when there is light in the soul, there will be beauty in the person. When there is beauty in the person, there will be harmony in the house. When there is harmony in the house, there will be order in the nation. And when there is order in the nation, there will be peace in this world. And that is my prayer and my wish for each of us, that we feel that light in our own hearts and souls. And through that, we help create peace here on this planet of ours. Thank you, Marcy. It has been such a pleasure having you with us today. Thank you, Joan.
This is Conversations with Joan. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.